Hi, everyone. This is Jason Burek of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's guest is a very special guest. He's one of my favorite market commentators. This is his first time on a podcast. It's Dr. Mark Faber. Uh, for our listeners who are not familiar, let me just summarize his bio because it is so long and impressive. I don't want to spend five minutes reading all of his accomplishments. Uh, I want to actually ask him some questions. So uh, Dr. Mark Faber, he's an a analyst of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom newsletter, and he's also written a best-selling book, which is uh, Tomorrow's Gold. Uh, Asia's Age of Discovery, and he's been the managing director in the past at Drexel Burnham, which was the king of the bond market in the uh, 80s. So uh, thank you, Mark, for joining us on a podcast. My pleasure. Thank you. Now, Dr. Farber, uh, my first question, we're going to uh, discuss the uh, debate between deflation and inflation. There's a lot of uh, experts out there that think that we actually have uh, inflation and deflation at the same time. Um, Many people like Eric Spada are arguing that we have uh, asset deflation while, and, and while at the same time we have uh, price inflation. Uh, do you agree or disagree with that assessment? Well, in any economic system, you can have some prices that go up and some prices that go down. I would define a deflationary period as a period during which the overall price level declines substantially, say by 10, 20 percent, and uh, this we haven't had. And now, if you say, okay, property prices after 2007 in some areas dropped 50 percent, yes, that is correct, but equally, the Nasdaq also dropped 70 percent after year 2000. So we can have in a system some assets, uh, some consumer prices, some consumer uh, commodity prices that go down, whereas others go up. In general, I would say we had over the last 20, 30 years a colossal asset inflation. Now, I agree that property prices went down and stock prices went down in the case of properties after 2007 and stocks after 2000. But if you take as a starting point, say, the early 1980s, then very clearly driven by easy monetary policies and excessive credit growth, uh, don't forget total credit as a percent of the economy in 1980 was roughly 140%. We're now at something like 280%, and that does not include the unfunded liabilities, which would drive the debt-to-GDP ratio to something like 800%. So we had this colossal asset inflation in stocks, properties, paintings, collectibles, bonds, and I just don't see great value anymore in asset prices. They're all at the relatively elevated level. And I agree with the strategists and economic thinkers that uh, say that one day this colossal asset inflation will come to an end and that at that point everything will go down. S&P 400, they say, or property prices down another 40%, and so forth and so on. Now, the question is, it will happen, for sure. The question is, from what level? Before it happens, the Fed and the Treasury can continue to inflate asset prices. Yeah, Mark, and um, what it seems to me that the, the, the Keynesians, all these global central bankers need is they're so worried about the, the solvency of all the banks that because they're so levered still that they need to prop up the asset prices because what, one, one of the... <laughs> I think you asked a very nice question. The central bankers are not worried about anything except their own jobs. In good English, by monetizing so much debt already, by having caused, to a large extent, 
the 2007-2008 crisis because they created credit before uh, and leverage and allowed this leverage and even encouraged leverage in the system. The crisis occurred. In good English, they're in so much shit that now they have to continue their policies which they implemented, which actually for the system as a whole is rather destructive. Yeah, and um, Mark, Morgan Stanley CEO James Gorman recently said there is a 0% chance of another financial crisis, and it seems to me that he thinks the central bankers will continue to do this asset price inflation. Uh, What do you think of his hubris? Quite frankly, I think the chances of another financial crisis are to higher, uh, today higher than they were in 2007 for the simple reason that, as was calculated by William White, who used to be at the BIS, total debt as a percent of the economy in developed countries today is 30% higher than in 2007. There is no question that another crisis will occur. The question is, will it occur tomorrow, which I don't think so, or in three years, five years, ten years? But you can rest assured it will happen in a huge way. Yeah, I think so too, Mark. And I think we're in the early stages of a uh, Von Mises-style crack-up boom where all this money is starting to flee, you know, the periphery in the developing world. And it's starting to come back to the U.S. in the real estate market, into our large-cap dividend stocks. And it's starting to push asset prices up way above uh, any rational valuations like you mentioned early, earlier in the interview. Well, yes, I mean, some money has come back to the U.S., but equally, I have to say, if I look at asset markets today, uh, the problem is uh, once you have zero interest rates, how do you value assets? You can only say this asset is relatively expensive, is relatively expensive compared to that asset, or this asset is relatively inexpensive compared to that asset. So if I look at the U.S. stock market, since now, precisely two years ago, October 7, 2011, the S&P went up from 1,074 to over 1,700. In other words, up almost 70%. It is up almost 200% from the lows in March 2009, S&P 666. So we had already a huge increase in stock prices, which was largely due to easy money, to money printing or monetary inflation by the Federal Reserve. And I doubt this will end well. And Dr. Farber, you uh, mentioned the Federal Reserve, and I want to uh, discuss, uh, you know, Ben Bernanke uh, is about to wrap up his final term as Fed chairman. And looking back at what he did, ever since he took over, he added over $2 trillion uh, to the U.S. money supply since September 2008. Uh, that's a over 250% increase. He also lowered interest rate from about 5% to almost zero. So uh, what do you make of his legacy and impact on the economy and, and the financial market? And 50 years from now, will historian and economists view him as a hero or a villain for his policies and ideas? And will it be similar to how economists and historians hail FDR as a hero for you know, taking the U.S. out of the Great Depression, even though his policy actually made everything worse uh, during the 1930s? Well, I don't think that anybody knows really what the legacy will be in terms of economic history books because, as you know, at the present time, the dominant economic thinking is guided by the so-called neo-Keynesians. They, for them, debt doesn't matter. The more debt there is, the better. 
fiscal deficits do not matter. The larger the deficits, the better. The more interventions by governments into the economy, the better. The more transfer payments, the more uh, entitlements, the better, and so forth. I don't think that this ideology will survive in the long run. Now, the Federal Reserve, at the present time, enjoys among, say, the financial circles, a good reputation, and i tell you why. The financial sector is only interested to have stocks going up and bonds rallying. So the net asset value of the portfolios that they manage goes up, and they get a bigger performance fee. That is their only interest, no other interest whatsoever. They do not consider that basically the Fed's monetary policy uh, has polarized America into people that were hurt by the asset bubbles, that's the majority, and uh, subsequently, after 2008, hardly recovered. These are data, I'm telling you, that are published and research, not by Mark Faber Limited, uh, the socialist, but by the Federal Reserve. And believe me, about the last thing I am is a socialist, but by the Federal Reserve itself. The 1 or 5% of the population, uh, their net worth has exceeded the 2007 high. The bottom 50% of the population their net worth is still down 44%. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Bernanke. And today, everybody speaks about the problem of the government shutdown. The government shutdown is not a problem. It is a symptom of a much wider problem. That I want Americans to clearly understand. Yeah, Mark, and I think the Fed policy here is destroying the middle class here in the United States and um, elsewhere. It's just the, the capitalist class or the middle class is what uh, allowed upward mobility. Uh, people could save money. They could work hard. They could do the right thing. They could build a good business or a reputation as an entrepreneur and, you know, move up the ranks that way. And I think that's becoming harder and harder uh, the more the Fed keeps intervening in markets. Actually, the half a percent of the population – didn't become rich in the last 20 years because of hard work. Now, there are exceptions, I concede, but the majority became very well-to-do because of asset inflation, because stocks went up, bonds went up, real estate went up. And when real estate collapsed, the poor people, they were foreclosed upon. They were kicked out of their homes in came the rich people buying up distressed properties. And I've been to Atlanta and Phoenix two and a half years ago, and I wrote about this, that some properties in Atlanta and Phoenix were cheaper than in Thailand. And subsequently, numerous investment companies went and bought these properties. They repainted a little bit the cracks and they're letting them out at rising rents. This is thanks to the policy of Mr. Bernanke. And in my view, Mr. Bernanke should be teaching at the kindergarten, not <laughs> even at the university. And for sure, he should never be a central banker. Uh and I think uh, the defining moment for uh, Bernanke is uh, when he came out and said there's no housing bubble back uh, in 2000, uh, before the 2008 <laughs> collapse. And then it actually it happened. Then he a year ago, yeah. when they implemented QE3, that turned into QE4. That was September 14th, 2012. In an interview, he said that the Fed uh, monetization, in other words, the asset purchases of 85 billion a month, 
which actually are more than a hundred billion dollar months because uh, they have a cash flow and so they're buying more and more so it's more than a hundred billion dollar month he said that would lead to lower interest rates what has happened the 10 years bond yield bottomed out precisely at 1.43 percent on july 25th 2012 and then we more than doubled to 3% recently. Now we eased a little bit back to around 2.63%. But all I'm saying is, if the Fed's objective was to lower interest rates, they messed up very badly. Now, now uh, Mark, do, do you think then that means the Fed is losing control of the bond market or it's all, already lost completely? Already lost control of the bond market. Wow. Uh, uh, yes. Um, uh, Fed, also I drew, I, you have to understand, I know some of these characters at the Fed. The Fed is a group thinking institute. They will never appoint anyone who has a very different view than they have. They're all academics. They never work in the private sector a day of their lives, except maybe as a consultant or something like this, but they never actually built the house or drove a taxi or did real jobs. They're all academics. And uh, basically, they are professors. I can tell you, you want to bankrupt the business, appoint some professors, to run it. For sure, it will be bankrupt within a year. Like long-term capital management, right, Mark? <laughs> Perfect. Correct. And as Milton Friedman said, if you put the government in charge of the desert, for sure there will be a shortage within three years of sand. <laughs> so I, I want to discuss the uh, my, my final question on, on the Federal Reserve is uh, the upcoming new Fed chairman that could be uh, Janet Yellen. Uh, do you think she'll try anything different that Bernanke had not tried to do? I, I, I know that she seemed to be more dovish than Bernanke. She could be a little bit more aggressive when it comes to uh, the QE programs or, and government intervention uh, regarding the monetary policy. Well, my sense is the following. Uh, in 2009, she said if it were possible to take interest rates into negative territory, I would be voting for that. In other words, if you have a deposit with a bank of $100,000 and after a year you only get 95000 back. Now, this uh, to implement this is technically not so easy. So what they can do is they keep interest rates below the rate of inflation. In other words, you have essentially zero interest rates at the present time, but I don't know where you and your viewers or listeners live, but for sure your cost of living is rising in the neighborhood of 5 to 7% per annum. So, basically, holding cash has a negative return, and this is the policy that Yellen advocates. And in my view, uh, Miss Yellen will make Mr. Bernanke look like a hawk. She will continue with the money printing. Now, what is interesting is that recently some voices have come up in these neo-Keynesian uh, brain-damaged academic circles that uh, would argue that the Treasury no longer needs to issue treasury bonds and treasury securities, but actually that the deficit will be financed entirely by the Federal Reserve, which they have done already this year. More than the treasury issues uh, this year were purchased by the Federal Reserve. So if that comes about, as Milton Friedman at that time explained, each time the government implements a program, they do it under some sense of urgency, and when things change, they never abandon 
They never give up on the program. They continue forever. And my view is that uh, the asset purchase program by the Federal Reserve is here to stay essentially permanently until, as I said, the final crisis wipes out the whole system and until, hopefully, the world will wake up to the detrimental nature of central bankers. Amen, Mark. I, I completely agree. Now, let's transition to more uh, another country that's been printing even longer than the U.S. Uh, let's talk about Japan and your opinion of what's going on there. Uh, do you think Japan is running out of time and the ability to control its bond market? And do you think Japan is the first country to experience a currency crisis? Well, it, they may have a currency crisis, but so far it hasn't happened. Uh, the bond market, in my view, is uh, less vulnerable than the U.S. because it's held domestically and not internationally. Uh, I think basically the country has a very low growth prospect, but we have to see one point. I've been going to Japan since 1973, and I experienced the boom times, and I've been to Japan practically every year since 1989 when the stock market started to tank, when property markets started to tank. It would be completely wrong for anyone to think that at any time Japan was in a depression. Prices went down but real incomes actually continued to increase. And the average standard of living of a Japanese is quite high, considering uh, the fact that they don't have much living space. It's a small island with 120 million people. Uh, the growth prospect is very low because the population is shrinking, and I doubt that they will open up the country to unlimited immigration, and probably rightly so. And also Japan had the uh, major demographic issue regarding uh, yes, exactly. a lot of people. The population will not grow, yeah. it will contract. So if you take that into, into account, uh, I agree with you. that. Uh, yes, but I, I want to tell you, maybe it's better to have a population of intelligent people and hard-working people that is contracting a little bit than a population that increase based on people that come into your country that want to abuse the system and uh, take advantage of all the benefits and not contribute anything to society. That's and I think you're... I think you're referring to the United States there. Yeah, yeah that, that's I a good... I wouldn't that's, think that far. I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, that's a, that's a good point. And, you know, America has changed a lot. Uh, in the past, there was no social programs. There was no social safety nets. If you were an immigrant, you had to come here just to feed yourself, and then you could, uh, you know, work, work your butt off and uh, move up the ladder and maybe own your own business someday. The American dream was not owning your own home or going on welfare or anything like that. The American dream was owning your own business, right? Or at least that's what the American Correct. dream used to be. Yeah. Correct. I would say, I think I went for the first time to the U.S. in the late 60s. I agree that society in America and also the whole political system and the police and the homeland security nonsense has changed the face of America. Not to the better, I may add. Um, I want to also ask you about the Asian uh, region in general. And there's a lot of uh, people out there like Jim Rogers that's saying that the economic, the transfer of economic power and wealth Coming, going back from the west to the east to China, to countries like China, Hong Kong, Singapore, where it's more business friendly, a uh, little bit less regulation and less taxes. Uh, do you think that? Uh, do you agree with that assertion that uh, the economic power will go back to the east to the Asian countries? Uh, well, sometime? if we look at say uh, exports as a percentage of global exports we look at industrial production in the world, 
and that oil consumption since, say, 2000, it is very evident that the emerging world has grown at a much faster pace than the developed world. It's not that the developed world has sunk to the bottom of the ocean. It's just that the others have grown at a much faster pace. And so the share in the world of, say, Asian countries in terms of economy has uh, grown dramatically, in particular China, but also some other countries, and the share in the global economy of the arrogant West has shrunk. And in my view, this will continue this trend, and what it will lead to is, as we increasingly see, huge geopolitical tensions. Now, um, Mark, one of, one of the things that Asia is just consuming more of, their standard of living is increasing, is commodities. Um, do, do you think the secular commodities bull market is over, or has it changed in your view to a bull market where commodities like base metals and coal are no longer in a bull market? Well, this is a very difficult question because we never know exactly when a bull market stops or so. But I would say that at the present time, we have to realize commodities had a huge run up since uh, 1999 until uh, July 2008, uh, when the oil price touched $147. Within six months, it then dropped to $32. Uh, thank you very much, Federal Reserve that is looking after price stability. The Federal Reserve has actually increased uh, price instability. They haven't created any price stability at all on the country. They increased economic and financial volatility. But the point is simply this. After that, commodity prices came down, partly also because the economy is weakening. And my sense is that... Uh, some commodity prices are now reasonably priced. Uh, I don't think that, as some forecaster was saying, you will ever again see like 12 or $15 per barrel oil prices. This is gone. Equally, you won't see $0.60 cents, uh, per pound copper prices. This is gone because the cost of mining and extraction has gone up very significantly over the last 10, 12 years. In the case of oil, if oil drops below $80, most oil companies will stop exploration. So the point is, uh, I think we had a period, 99 to essentially today, where commodities have performed much better than, say, the Dow Jones or the S&P. And uh, I think this outperformance is over. Now, will money printing by the Fed drive commodities higher over time? Likely. Yes, likely. Uh, I personally advise individual investors to be very careful with buying essentially commodity ETFs because the rollover cost is very high. Uh, there are huge losses in commodity ETFs. But if someone believes that essentially money, paper money, will depreciate in value, I would tell it now gold and silver have declined in almost 50% from the highs, gold 30% from the highs. So relative to the S&P, I suppose that gold is reasonably priced. It's not the perfect entry point, but it's reasonably priced. And, I, and I've, I've, I've seen you talk about gold a lot in, uh, on TV and other podcasts and interviews, but uh, I haven't seen you talk about silver that much. I want to get your thoughts on the silver market in general, and do you think it's a good alternative to buying uh, instead of gold, since a lot of people can't afford to buy gold because uh, it's very expensive for one yeah, ounce of coins? Uh, well, you know... 
you can thank uh, Mr. Bernanke for having impoverished so many people. A eh? first through the Nasdaq bubble, where people lost a fortune when Nasdaq stocks collapsed. Uh, and I concede he wasn't Fed chairman at the time, but at the time the Fed, under Mr. Greenspan, and Mr. Bernanke as the kind of intellectual mentor, was deliberately fueling a bubble. But thereafter it collapsed, it bankrupted, or at least impoverished many people. And then they fueled another, or superimposed another bubble, by the way, on the advice also of Mr. Krugman. Thank you very much, Mr. Krugman. Uh, he would be better off by just writing a column than by influencing uh, economic thinking. Now, uh, the problem is that uh, when these bubbles burst, the majority of people lose money, and some people make a lot of money, because at the beginning of a bubble, uh, the promoters have the vision and the investors the money, and at the end of the bubble, when everything collapses, the promoters have the money and the, the investors have the vision. This is the usual uh, cycle of bubbles. Uh, the problem is today that uh, we don't know what assets are really worth. Uh, is gold cheap at 1300 I would say maybe compared to the Dow Jones, but maybe it's not all that cheap. In the scenario of a major uh, implosion, in other words, a complete collapse of the debt bubble, in that case it is possible that gold goes down maybe 50%. But I always say, Maybe it's better to lose 50% in gold than to lose 90% in stocks at the time or 100% in government bonds. Who knows? And concerning silver, I would say, yes, it's maybe easier for an individual to buy silver than gold. And maybe, as my friend Eric Sprott maintains, and I'm on the board of his company, Maybe it's even better value, and some intelligent people, they think it's better value. Some other things, uh, people think that palladium and uh, platinum are better value. That I all don't know. All I can say is silver, gold, platinum, uh, and uh, palladium will move in the same direction. I'm not qualified to say which one will move up the most, and which one will move up the least? That I don't know. Yeah, Mark. Because um, I don't belong to the strategists of Wall Street that know everything. <laughs> That's a good point, Mark. And um, one of the things in in the bullish case for gold and silver right now is that there, uh, for a lot of the primary gold and silver miners, the metals price is way below the production cost. So as a long term investor. It's, it's always good if you can buy a commodity with a longer-term view way below the cost of production because as long as demand is continuing to increase, and I see demand yes, yes, increasing. I agree with all this, except I can tell you if the prices stay at this level for another one year or so, a lot of exploration mining companies will be forced to the wall. They'll go bankrupt. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that's likely too. But I think that's helpful. So anyway, I'm uh, now slowly coming to the end of this interview. Uh, if you have any further questions, please ask me. Sure, Mark. Um, I have one more question, and we'll wrap things up, and it's related to precious metals. Um, you live out in Asia, so do, do you see demand for physical gold and physical silver still increasing from Asia? Statistically, the demand for physical gold is very strong. But uh, I was recently in a brokerage firm that deals in stocks and all kinds of other investments in Bangkok, and they had a huge trading room. It was kind of empty. And uh, I then talked to one of the staff and said, how come you have such a huge trading room? There are hardly any customers here. Uh, maybe they lost money because the Thai stock market from its high in around May, to its recent low, dropped by something like 30%. So I said, maybe your customers lost uh, some money, maybe 50% uh, 
of what they had. And this staff, uh, a lady, she told me, uh, it's not 50%. They were wiped out uh, because they speculated on margin in equities and especially in gold on margin. And I advise every one of your listeners to essentially, over time, uh, accumulate some silver and gold, uh, but obviously not on margin, because I've seen in my life so many times people who were over leveraged, uh, an adverse, a correction came and they were wiped out. And that's a great point, Dr. Faber. Uh, we'd like to thank you for coming on the Wall Street for Main Street podcast. Uh, if people want to find out more about your work, uh, can you give, give out uh, the name of your website, please? Uh, com, or just Google my name, Mark Faber. And um, I, I want to thank you very much for your time, Dr. Faber. I know everyone well, it's wants... it's a pleasure, and it's nice talking to you. Yeah, and hopefully we, we can have... We must fight governments. We must fight governments with all our means. I agree. That's why we're doing so many of these podcasts with, like, you and Jim Rogers and Doug Casey. Um, and hopefully we can have you back on soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.